Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith, and I'm happy to introduce our guest today, four-time Emmy-nominated songwriter, sound designer, and composer, Evan Frankfurt. Evan's innovative musical contributions in both television and indie rock have offered uniquely captivating soundscapes for nearly 30 years. He currently serves as head of music for Hearst Media, as well as frontman of the innovative indie rock band The Spiritual Machines and co-creator of Less Friction. His past credits include shows like The 100 and Beverly Hills 90210, and he has collaborated with iconic artists like The Bengals, Plain White Tees, Rancid, Warren Zevon, and Liz Fair. And I'm so excited to talk with him, and I'm so grateful that he's here to join us. So Evan Frankfurt, thank you so much for being here, and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Thanks for having me. Great to be here with you guys. I'm so excited to chat with you and to kind of pick your brain about your creative process and um, and kind of what you do, because you have so much creativity and you have so much history in the music business. But your history with music goes back generations. And you have, I, I believe it's like you're the sixth generation musician in your family. Is that right? <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, like, <laughs> was there ever any question that you were going to be a professional musician or is it just like the family business? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I would say most of the family came to their senses and entered the business world once they realized they were in for a lifetime of punishment and pain. Um, <laughs> and, you know, realized it didn't have to be that way. Um, minimize suffering, not a bad plan. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, my my grandmother was uh, probably the most serious of all the musicians. And, uh, you know, the difference with me and the rest of the family is that they're all players and they play what's written on the page. And, um, you know, I think I just don't have that in me. I have ideas and I want to express and I want to create. And um, and so everything is just a vehicle to make something Um from my perspective, and um, I had to sort of, you know, um, find my own road um, because, you know, they just were more conventionally minded and um, I was never going to get a standing ovation. Like, it's just not going to happen for me. Um, but I'm looking for a melody. I'm looking for a part. I'm looking for something that makes me feel something. And... Um, being a musician is only as important as being able to play my ideas. So once that happens, um, I lose interest and I want to play another instrument. I want to engineer. I want to be a part of another part of the process. And, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think I always knew that I would make music. I didn't really know in what capacity because I did love it all. And mm -hmm. I did feel like um, it was all equally important. And so, um, you know, those people that singularly focus on one lane and become masters, um, my, my hat's off to them. That's fantastic. And it's magic to me. I could never be that person or, um, I mean, if I live long enough, if I live to be 500, like I'm planning, then maybe <laughs> I will be that person. But, you know, in, uh, in my abbreviated lifetime, I don't see it happening. So you mean like mastering like the technical skill of one instrument, because I would venture to say that you've become a master of engineering and producing and composing. Is that would you not consider yourself that at this point? That's boy. I mean, you know, really, I, I'm just trying to be the best me that I can be. Um, uh -huh. And when I compare myself to, you know, Serban or any of these other like truly spectacular mixers, um, I know the difference, you know, I hear their mixes and I say, I can't be that guy, but they're not the only ones making records I love, you know, there are people who are homespun that make records that I'll never truly understand. And to me, you know, that's the fun of it is, is, well, how did this happen? Let's try to crack the code on this. And so if I can't do that, then you know, that's where the inspiration is for me is, is, is to be that person where maybe they won't be able to crack the code on what I did. There's um, a term um, called hiding the tool. Have you heard this? 
No. So painters and sculptors used it. Like if you were okay. using a brush or a, um, you know, just whatever you used, you didn't want it to be seen, right? Um, you you didn't want it to be evident that you used what you used. And so um, if I can hear, like, that's a Fender Stratocaster plugged into a Fender Twin, then... I'm over it. Like, I've heard that a billion times. I don't want that. Like, I, gotcha. I just have to run it through something where it's unrecognizable to me. And um, and now I'm somewhere, you know. Now I'm, I'm in a place where I'm curious. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, that was always the plan is to make art, you know. And, um, and, and I, I wouldn't do that if I was going to just be a technician. Um, and, and honestly, I just think people are different. Um, I mean, I've been in the room with people that have played one note and brought me to tears. It's just in how they articulate, how they express. And so people have gifts for, you know, endless amounts of things. And, um, and I think that, you know, my, my only gift is that, um, I, I can be curious and lead myself to a place where I, I feel like, um, this is what I want to hear with spiritual machines and other projects. Um, it's, it's really just about why we do what we do, what makes us human and, and how will we retain our humanity when, you know, we're living in the cloud forever and there's no organic matter left. And like, what, <laughs> what is it, you know, what is it about us and mm -hmm. what are these machines that we consider spiritual? Oh, that is so interesting. Is that, is that kind of where the idea of spiritual machines came from? Is this idea of, of, uh, I don't know, like the connection and the curiosity? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it came from uh, a term coined by Ray Kurzweil, Kurzweil Keyboards. Um, you know, he he believes that uh, we're headed towards singularity, which means that, you know, we are going to become one thing with, you know, robots, essentially. And we'll back up our brains and live in the cloud forever. And so um, the question is, you know, what defines us as individuals and um, and that subjective consciousness will never go away, but the physical consciousness might because, um, you know, when there's no more suffering and there's no more bodies to control, we're still going to control things with our mind. Like we have Neuralink now that connects our brains to our bodies and, um, you know, can sort of reignite pathways that um, were lost. But... Um, but ultimately, you know, we're going to be this thinking machine that is a unique identity and we're still going to be human. You know, we're still going to suffer and we're still going to need to feel loved and we're going to still have the need to create and we're going to have desires. And so um, what does that look like? And that's kind of where my interest in the topic started is what, what really is humanity. And then I started thinking about spiritual machines. And I was like, well, instruments are spiritual machines, you know, right. uh, something that, you know, makes us feel powerful and whole and complete. And, um, and then I started asking myself, what's a spiritual machine for other people? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a kid, it was watches. Um, that was the first thing, like technologically, that I fell in love with. I mean, it was a piano because no one understands that. Like, that's just crazy. I hit this thing and music happens. And so you can see patterns and shapes and, yeah. you know, that amounts to music. And, oh, this pattern is so easy to see and easy to play. Maybe there's a reason that it sounds good. And the connection mm -hmm. between, you know, what makes sense and simplicity and beauty. And I think that goes straight down the line to e equals MC squared. Like, all the best, you know, calculations are simple. Um, right. And, you know, we're, we talk about quantum and we talk about offsets and we talk about all these things where it becomes so convoluted and, and, and detail-laden that it, the simplicity is lost. 
But with watches, it was very simple. It was an aesthetic. I loved them. And um, they were elusive to me. You know, my parents wouldn't buy me one. I used to tie a little rag around my wrist and pretend it was a watch. <laughs> and um, by the time I did get a watch, it was not the one that I felt like I identified with. I felt like I wasn't, you know, explaining myself or I wasn't seen. And um, and so it was it became this lifelong pursuit. And so ultimately it just made my own. And so um Wait, you, you made know, your own watch? I did. This is this is actually it. I don't know if you can see it, but um What? Yeah. yeah. It's um spiritual machines timepieces. So <laughs> yeah. So I said, <laughs> I'm going to start my own watch. And so um, I worked with a designer and made this like, you know, amalgamation of all the things that I love. And um, as it happens, I love flagger type V type B faces, which is like a, a military pilot's watch. And okay. it's just something I connected with. And then it became colors and materials and, you know, shapes and patterns and things like that. And so I think when we ask ourselves what we like, it's really uh -huh. such a big question that you have to break it down into tiny little components. And so, right. you know, when you're starting with a piano, say, it could just be one note at a time and you'll get there. And then two notes is twice as complex, but still very simple. Mm -hmm. And you will find something if you just play two notes at a time. And then, you know, you can get more complex and layered, but I do feel like that's where the slippery slope is, you know, is like, what are we really trying to do? Okay. We're trying to make people feel something. Right. And so the danger is that you, um, you miss that opportunity because you got bogged down with proving something. Oh, what I like I that. Yeah. I like that a lot. And I find a lot of um, I find myself getting caught up in that because I think you're right. We're trying to make people feel things. And I think we're trying to connect with them, honestly, almost like soul to soul sort of thing. Like I'm sharing part of myself, which is why I love live performances so much because you can have that connection with someone. And yeah, it's very easy to get bogged down with, with the technical and like trying to prove yourself to somebody else. And that, and you do lose some music doing that. You know, I mean, I think we are almost opposites that way, um, where playing live is something that I think most people, they get into it for. They want to connect yeah. with an audience and they want to feel that exchange of energy. Yeah. And it is so powerful. Like, I mean, there's nothing that matches that. I think that's why, you know, so many performers become addicts, um, drug addicts, you know, um, yeah. because they get off stage and they want the high to continue. Yeah. And nothing matches that, you know. Um, and so I lived a very simple and small life where, um, you know, I came home and took out the trash every day. But I woke up in the morning, you know, feeling like whatever jumps out of the speakers is the only thing in the world that I can control. And mm, so okay. um, I'm not what you are, where I can get on stage and blow people away. I can only... I mean, I can't even remember my own songs. Like some people are campfire <laughs> musicians where they have this repertoire of a thousand songs and you'll say, play, you know, Hard Day's yeah. Night or whatever. And they know it all. They've learned every song and they've memorized it. Like, I can't even remember. Like, I'll get through a verse and I'll go, where does it go next? I don't know. Like, but th I have an idea right now. I'll play that and make yeah. something up. So yeah. um, when I toured, it was really, you know, I lived for those moments when, it became jazz, you know, when we left the arrangement behind and like, oh, you did something there. I want to get with that. And like, oh, that gives me an idea. And so I'll, mm -hmm. I'll build on those moments. And those are the things that, you know, I live for um, because I feel like the rote memory stuff, it's not me, you know, I yeah. can't do it. If I could, yeah. do it, I would do it, you know, um, because yeah. I want what you have. I want to be able to like, you know, have those powerful moments on stage. But for me, the equivalent is um, ideas breeding ideas. You get into yeah. this groove where, you know, and another thing and another thing and another thing. It's electric, that process. Well, you actually said something in an interview that I was listening to, and I loved this. 
And I was hoping you could talk more about it. You said you can't be the producer and the generator at once. Yeah. I was just, I thought that was amazing. I love that. I was wondering oh. if maybe you could kind of talk about that a little bit. I was like, Ooh, that's really neat. Because you think about when you're composing a lot of, you know, composers have to be, you know, especially in smaller projects, not the larger projects that you're doing, but the, like the ones starting out have to be their own producer and their own composer at the same time. And a lot of bands have to be their own mixers as they're starting out. Um, but you're saying that you don't do that at the same time. So I was hoping no, you could No, I think talk about you that. need two brains to do that. You know, we're okay. talking about opposite skill sets. One is creation and the other is judging. Um, okay. And so you'll, you're, you'll literally talk, talk yourself out of generating if you're judging. So, okay. um, you know, y you have this process where you're thinking everything is brilliant and mm -hmm. you're going to change the world with this idea. And that's what it takes. You have to feel that way. Otherwise, why would you do it? You know, if you're not thinking that you're breaking new ground or um, you're, you're having this moment where you feel lucky to be in it, then you wouldn't feel compelled to come back to it. Um, and so when you're in that moment, you have to protect it. Um, it's like protecting your love of music, right? If anything makes you hate music, like it becomes your job and you're just playing on records that you hate, or if you're writing music you hate, um, you can do that for so long before you feel like, well, why am I doing this? I would rather do anything than this. Give me bricks, I'll lay bricks. Um, but not this, because it's it's poisoning it for me. And so... Mm -hmm you have to protect that feeling of I'm a genius. Like everybody <laughs> has that where, you know, you have a moment where you played something that was out of reach or you wrote something that is beyond your ability. It felt like it dropped out of the sky. It was a gift from, you know, the heavens. So, um, so if you don't have those moments, then it's probably because you're thinking, no, that's not good enough. Mm. Or, um, I don't know what's wrong with this, but, um, this isn't quite right. And then you, you hamstring yourself right there. You, you say, okay, um, I have to solve a problem and you don't want to think that you want to think there is no problem. There's only freedom. You know, this road is not a road. It's, it's really just open sky and we're not driving a car. We're flying. And so anything is possible and everything is doable. And that's why you get this sort of contagious spiral of ideas where you're willing to try anything, things that are total pain in the butt. Like, I'm going to go get an egg beater and I'm going to use it on this lap steel and, you know, just make it do something, make some noise out of it. Or, you know, I don't know, put the mic inside the guitar. You know what I mean? Like wh whatever it is. Yeah. Like let's, let's put the mic literally under the strings of the piano. I mean, how would a prepared piano have been made if somebody didn't have that spirit for adventure? And so it might be useless 99% of the time, but you know, we talked really quickly before we got into this about the burning piano. I mean, mm -hmm. they're burning piano samples, which are awesome. Like you can literally hear the crackling of the soundboard as you're playing it. And, oh my goodness. You know, and it does fall apart while you're playing it and strings right. break and all that. And so um, I think these kinds of ideas, um, they don't happen to people that are trying to solve problems. They happen to people that are just looking for inspiration and you never know where that's going to be. But once you've, laid it all out there and you've said i did everything i can do you know i have a thousand tracks on this song um that's when you have to become you know judgmental yeah and and say all right really it was just track seven and 950 that are the magic when those play together we're in a place where you know that's all we need you mm -hmm. think economically, you're thinking about, um, you know, refining and you're thinking about, you know, how to set this thing up. There could be 
literally anything, but that's when you have this process where you're sifting and you're looking for the gold. And when you find it, you might find now I'm in another process of creativity and like, you know, all this other stuff goes out the window and this one track dictates what I do forward. It's now the centerpiece of the the recording. And so mm-hmm. um, if you do have time to explore that, then why wouldn't you, you know? Right. I mean, that's what it is. A song can take 10 years. And if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. I mean, tenacity yeah. is the key word. Yeah. <laughs> but when you How want long? it, yeah, you'll fight. Yeah, that's true. Even that's true. Yourself, you know? Yeah. Well, you have a very busy career in itself. How do, do you make time? Like, do you say, okay, uh, is it, I guess is your creativity kind of spontaneous or do you like schedule out times that you can do this? I mean, it's both, right? So yes, I sit down and I try to play something every day. I just <laughs> see where, you know, where it goes. You have a relationship with an instrument. The instrument talks to you and says, let's try this. You hear a note, you hear an interval, you hear uh, a register and you, you just go and explore it. And so, mm-hmm. um, it could be, you know, that you sit down to do that and nothing happens. And then you're in the middle of a conversation and somebody in that conversation says something that triggers you. And you're like, okay, now I know what to do. Everybody get lost. I'm going to go to work. Or you're in the middle of a gig and you're, um, you know, you're, you're writing music completely unrelated, but, you know, some seed gets planted, some, you know, match gets sparked and, and you put it aside for a minute and, you know, even if you just work for 10 minutes, um, you'll get some sort of germ going. And it's amazing how easy it is to return to that stuff. Because like I said, every idea breeds an idea. And so really all you needed was your voice memo. I mean, my phone is full of it. And so I have probably a thousand that are just, you know, starts. And when I hear any one of them, I'll go, ah, I know what to do now. And in some cases I didn't then, and the time separation allows you to be, you know, fresh and impartial. Um, I mean, that's the only thing that I worry about is that I actually realize my idea exactly as I envisioned it. Um, Because 100% of the time it's, you know, okay at best. Really? So you're hoping that it will grow and that it will change as you work on it? Oh, I'm counting on it. You know, mm. if I don't get lost along the way, then there's a hundred percent chance that it's not going to be anything. Really? Uh, or that you're just retreading, right? You're just uh-huh. revisiting space that you've been in a million times and, or, or you've been in enough times to say, we're not writing that song again. Um, and I think that's the reason I start projects is, um, I just want to do something I haven't done before. Do something you haven't done before. Yeah. So, um, so you were saying that a lot of that connection and a lot of that feeling whole comes as part of the creative process. Um, are you, do you feel like you're most creative by yourself or do you enjoy collaborating or is it just kind of different animals? I mean, I, I love collaborating. I feel like um, it's team sports for people like us, you know, mm-hmm. where if you can find somebody who thinks the way that you think only better or more refined for whatever that element is then or maybe they do think like you and um you understand them but they're not you and so what happens is you react to them and you're instantly in a place you don't recognize so um you know the only danger of collaborating is when you just can't agree on what's cool Yes. But if you both listen to a record or you, you know, something impacts you both and you're looking at each other like, yeah, this is cool. Then you you're going to have an amazing relationship because you're all you're both going to get someplace where you couldn't get along. Mm -hmm. No, that's very true. And it's like just yeah, it's it's amazing to do that. Now, if we talk about the spiritual machines, um, it's you have orchestral elements and you have vocals and you have more indie rock sort of elements to it how did you decide on i guess the voice or the sound of of this group yeah i mean um i would say it came off the heels of less friction that i Mm -hmm. do with um my my brother from another mother uh helmet von lichten um 
So my my relationship with uh, with Helmut uh, von Lichten, we we really wanted to do the same thing, which is sort of a rock opera inspired um, band that would be, you know, maybe remnants of um, Pink Floyd and Queen and maybe, you know, just things that were maybe even more modern. But um, but, you know, that stuff was probably um, more orchestral in nature. And then it would have elements of rock band and world instruments and electronics and things woven in. Um, but, you know, the spiritual machines was probably more in my mind, a rock band in the core that could be dressed in any clothes I wanted to. Um, and that's kind of, you know, how I think of machines is, um, they, they can be anything, you know, um, so there's a certain freedom in that. There's a certain, um, you know, feeling like this can get really small. You know, it can be very intimate. Um, it can be very organic. It can be very electronic. You know, there's just, you know, cogs and wheels that were wood. Like, you know, it's still a machine. Um, but the the idea to me was wide open. And so um, I wanted it to be... Um, you know, in the beginning, I wanted it to be a rock band dressed in other clothing. And so okay. um, just to kind of keep it interesting and different, you know? Yeah. Now it's evolved into something more 80s and you know, <laughs> very uh, like pop rock. And mm -hmm. who knows what the next evolution, maybe all roads will lead back, you know? But yeah, um, but yeah the idea of it taking a journey, you know... You can only do that when you just have no responsibilities to anyone or anything, uh, just the project and just the ideas. Um, so with a label, that could never happen. You know, they would say, oh, you know, we want you to pick this song that was the most successful song and essentially do another 50 like it. Um, so with this, I don't have any demands and I can just go wherever I feel like it. Um, and, and this new wave thing is, is very, it's weird, you know, like it's <laughs> always been deep inside of my fabric, but, um, okay. I only call on it for moments and for ideas, but I've never actually committed to it as a sound. And so, um, you know, part of it was feeling like a return to, like why I love bands and why I got into this in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, who would I jump on my bed to and play air guitar? I mean, the first record I fell in love with was um, The Who, Quadrophenia. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that's more of a rock opera, but it's still The Who. It's still a band right. and you hear that at the core. And so, yeah. um, you know, I'm not sure whether Spiritual Machines translates the same way, but let's just say that was you know, at the core of my thinking when I, when I started this. Wow. That's very, yeah. Yeah. That's really great. And so I'm trying to connect the dots of how rock opera meet. I mean, you were saying they're all machines and stuff, but then this idea of singularity and rock opera, how do those meet? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, it's really just about picking a theme and okay. writing in context of that theme. And gotcha. so okay. I have a lot of these bands that'll start under monikers and, <laughs> um, you know, I'll talk about family in this one. I'll talk about, um, you know, uh, what makes us human in the spiritual machines. Um, the spiritual machines actually is more of a conversation is what I've discovered. Um, you know, asking the question, what is your spiritual machine? And uh, it's different for everyone. You know, my my friend Chris George, who's an amazing artist, will tell you that it's a mechanical pencil. This particular mechanical pencil allows me to operate at my best. Um, and so, you know, for, for us, it's instruments, you know, for, it's gear, it's things with VU meters and tubes and big light knobs and, you know, fun toys to play with. Um, but there's some mojo in that box. I think what, what we identify with is the imperfections, you know, cause when things are 
linear, like there's a reason you play a real piano. There's something about it that's unpredictable. You know, it's unwieldy. It's not going to behave 100% of the time. I mean, Kawhi is a little bit more, you know, predictable and a little like, you know, more linear. But oh, it's I true, like but the 150-year-old piano where it's just never going to be in tune. <laughs> it responds to the weather. Like, is it raining? Does it have that buzz going on? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Those are great. Yeah. And how do yeah. the pedals feel? Like, do they yeah. feel like, you know, uh, a MIDI pedal or does it feel like it's mechanical? Right. And so right. we respond to things that are mechanical, I think, because we see ourselves in them, hmm. um, you know the the imperfections of humanity show up in these machines they don't last forever right. um they do need to be tuned they do need to be tweaked they do need to be rebuilt and it's in those moments like um i don't know if you've heard of demeter gear uh no, demeter is, jim demeter is a guy who makes amps for guitars he makes okay. mic trees and compressors his thing is to overload circuits and so if you, uh, or tubes, you know, and so mm -hmm. it, if you've ever heard an amp that's almost about to die, that's yeah. when it sounds the best. That's when it sounds the best, when the tubes are about to go. And so he discovered this, like, why is it that like the last 5% of a life of a tube is when it sounds <laughs> the best? Well, there's something right there that's unsteady. It's unstable. Okay. And it's like that with synthesis, like when you've pushed it too far and you might have to reboot because you've broken it, like uh -huh. that's when it's coolest. Yeah. Right at that edge, right? Gotcha. And so um, it's like that with gain, you know, on Mike Priest. Mm -hmm. It's like that with um, compressors where it's just almost too much, but that's where you got to go too far, you know, to know how far too far is. Yeah. So oh, that's yeah, really I think cool. that's what we love about machines. And that's my conversation is why and what do we love? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you were on a desert island, you had could have one machine with you. What would it be? What would be your one spiritual machine? Can I play my watch somehow? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if um, you were going to say your watch. I was wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I could do the most with a guitar or a piano. Um, um, so, yeah, I would have to say, I mean, on an acoustic guitar, Desert Island, like, that just makes sense to me, right? Those <laughs> those, those components go together. Yeah, it works. It I'll works. play and... Jimmy Buffett songs. I'll learn how to play <laughs> them first, and then I'll play them. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll just be happy around the campfire playing your repertoire yeah. of Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> yeah, we can waste away in Margaritaville. <laughs> But, um, um, yeah, but I have loved chatting with you. We could have like, we could just talk all day about this stuff. I think it's likewise. so, so, so great. Um, really, really quickly. I would just, before we end, you're mm -hmm. also a music director and that has to be a really, really busy job. How do you balance your creativity with managing so many other people that are creating music? Like how, how does your day have enough hours in it to do all these things? Well, at first it was, you know, a hundred hours a week. Um, right. Where you have yeah. to build something. Right. And, um, and then you get through the lion's share of the process and it's more about maintaining it. Um, and so, you know, there are times when it's very, very busy and there are times when there's literally nothing going on. Um, but, you know, I feel like these lives, um, they inform each other and I enjoy them both. And so I think I would miss not doing it um, if, I, if I didn't do it anymore. Um, you know, they it's kind of like what we talked about with simplicity of equations and, you know, in, in, in an idea of any kind. Um, I feel like they're not really that different. Um, you have this e economy of scale. You have an economy in thinking about how you're producing something or mixing something or creating something. Um, and so there's, you know, overlapping, um, you know, disciplines. And so I, I would just have to say that um, 
you know, with music, I love it all and I look forward to it all. And so I have this incredible team. We're all like-minded, but everybody is specialized. Everybody has a discipline that they are better than everyone else at. And so it's, it's like having a band. It's like having, you know, a football team or anything else where we just feel like we can conquer the world together. And mm. so who wouldn't want that? You're right. Yeah. So they all work together really well. I love that. That's so great. Um, well, we have to finish up here. And I'm so sorry because I would love to keep ta talking with you. Um, but you have so much experience and you've been on every side of this musical life that you've lived. And it's just wonderful. If you have one piece of advice for aspiring musicians, what would it be? Well, I would say, um, you know, the obvious thing is to find the thing that you connect with uh, this this process is uh self-sustaining you know when you spend 10 hours in a day and you ask yourself where the time went you know you're doing what you love and what you're meant to do and so um it fuels itself you know when you put 10 hours in and you think ah, eh, i could do another 10 hours whatever that is if you've had your ass kicked and you don't know it you're in the right place uh so I would say find whatever that is and start right there. And because for me, like I tried not to know anything about picture. I said, I already know, you know, all I can know about sound. Like I can listen to your movie and tell you that you mix the air conditioner too loud <laughs> like, um, or not loud enough, you know, oh, there would have been more tension. Right. So um, I didn't want to do that with picture, but something happened to me where I started editing, making music videos and, um, and I just loved it. Like it was, I felt like a kid again. And so now like that door is kicked wide open and I'm into, you know, treatments and, you know, color and all the things that I tried not to notice. Yeah. And now the problem is I'll watch something and be like, oh, the light was wrong on that cut. Like it looks oh. different, right? <laughs> so when they cut to him, it just looks different than when they cut to him. They couldn't reconcile them somehow. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was trying to avoid. I wanted to always get lost in the magic of, of movies and, mm. and shows. And so, um, whoops, too late. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that the enjoyment far outweighs what I've lost because you still do lose yourself. When something's great, mm -hmm. it's always going to be great. Yeah. And yeah, maybe you can pull it apart, but that's how you know what's great is you don't. Right. You know? Oh, I yeah. forgot to pull it apart. Must be good. <laughs> 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 I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if anybody wants to learn more about Spiritual Machines or your upcoming album, where can they find that? Um, so it's on your 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 platform of choice, Spotify, mm -hmm. Apple Music. Um, and uh, I just started an Instagram page. I think I have like you know, 50 followers. I'm so excited. Oh, we'll so, follow you. This will um, be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Thank you. Will do. <laughs> great. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, yeah. Evan Frankfurt, thank you so much for being here. It's been just such a joy chatting with you. Likewise, Christine. Thanks for having me.